Well, we're continuing our study in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Um, we have been away for a while, so tonight I'm going to do a brief review. I have a tendency to do that, just like to catch people up on the, on the word and, and what we've been looking at. It is very important that we recognize when we open up the word of God that you cannot cover the word too much. Do you know that? If, you, if anybody thinks that I've read that before, I already know that, you missed the whole point. <laughs> so the word is, is an entity that we have to go over and over and over and over and over. Why? Because that's how you receive revelation. And what you'll find out is that uh, in that process, light comes. It continually comes when you have an open heart and mind to receive from God's word. So that being said, uh, we're going to launch uh, in chapter three. But in order to do that, I, want, I do want to just rehearse just a little bit about this particular story, because First Thessalonians, it does uh, present to us a story, a historical story as to what happened in the uh, first century regarding this particular group of believers. Now, in order to get a picture of this, and I trust that you'll remember this. Go back with me if you would turn back in your Bibles once again to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And you'll find out and you'll remember, and I trust you'll remember, that it is in Acts chapter 17 that we get the backdrop on the story as to what happened with the church that was formed called Thessalonians. So if we go back to Acts chapter 17, because Acts chapter 17 is a historical book that actually recounts um, the early portion of the church and what some of the specific details. So if we look in Acts chapter 17, here it is. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1 of Acts chapter 17. The scripture reads, Now when they had passed through Amphibolus and Alpononia, uh, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now, They've come to Thessalonica. They have come from Philippi. Can you say Philippi? Now, the journey there from Philippi to Thessalonica is about 100 miles. And in this 100 miles journey, they didn't have a vehicle. They, they probably walked. So if you recall what happened to them in Philippi, they were, they were beaten brutally and then thrown into the jail, into the inner stocks. They were greatly disrespected and after all that they come from Philippi and they head out to do what? Preach the gospel once again. So now we pick them up and they're in Thessalonica. And notice what happens in Thessalonica. It says in verse 2, and Paul as his manner was went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scripture. So the Sabbath days, the, the Shabbat would be Saturday from our standpoint. So he would go in. He went in three weeks in a row to the Jewish synagogue. And what did he do? Here, it picked us up in verse 3. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Now, here's the thing. Verse 3 tells us this. Here is the gospel again in a nutshell. Paul went to the synagogue, and he's talking to these Jews primarily. But there were also devout Greeks who were referred to as proselytes who were also uh, frequenting and visiting the synagogue. And so Paul is doing what? He's telling them two aspects. Number one, who Jesus was and what Jesus did. Can you say that? Who Jesus was and what Jesus did. So when Paul preached to people, what did he preach to them? He preached to them the person of Jesus Christ, who Jesus was, and what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection, which would be the redemption process. You may, it doesn't make any sense to you. Now, what does that say to us? It tells us what we're supposed to be telling people. If I'm going to share the gospel with somebody, I should be sharing with them what? Who Jesus was and what Jesus did. Right? Sometimes the, the gospel message gets so watered down into human experience, our experiences, and, for, and we leave off the reality of telling people who Jesus was and what he did. That's where the power is. Amen. Amen. So this is what Paul was sharing. 
Let's, let's continue. In verse 4, it says, and some of them believe. Some who? Some Jews believe. Some Jews, right? Then he goes on to say there, and uh, they joined or concerted with Paul and Silas, and there were a large number of Greeks that believed. So what has just happened? A large number of Greeks, and also within that number, it also highlights that a large number of Greek, prominent Greek women now, what does that mean? It means that these were women who were powerful, which meant, probably meant they had powerful husbands. They were wealthy. So now you have what? You have now a church that has been born. And here's the thing. This church is not just made up of Jews. It's a church that is made up of Jews and Gentiles. Now, this was something that had never existed prior to Jesus coming. Because predominantly, when you talk about the synagogue or, or thought about the synagogue, it was morally, mostly a Jewish religion. But now, because of the gospel, you have Jews and Gentiles getting born again and worshiping together. I mean, the walls of division are, are torn down because of the work of Jesus Christ. Isn't that powerful? Yes, it is. So now we have the church of Thessalonica has been birth. It's a large church. Now, folks, listen. They don't have a church building. The church is not a building. The church is people. This is the church. It's made up of what? Jews and Gentiles. Right? Now, let's keep, because let's, let's continue, because what, what else happened in that particular setting? Verse 5, and the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city in uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. So here's what happened. You had Jews that were unbelieving Jews, but what inflamed them is that they saw these Gentiles receiving the gospel. And you understand what's going on. This is spiritual warfare, you understand, correct? So you have demonic spirits that are trying to shut down what? The proclamation of the gospel. So what do they do? They start an uproar in the city. And the Bible tells us this. It tells us that um, they, this crowd, and what that means is a mob. And one of the most dangerous things when you're dealing with people are mobs. Because what do mobs do? They are uncontrolled, undisciplined, and they will do anything. So now Jason, who is a convert, recent convert, he opens his front door and there's this huge mob standing there yelling, uh, all, cussing, all that kind of thing. And what did they do? They come in and drag him and some other brothers out. Why did they choose this house? Because Paul undoubtedly had been living there, staying there. And they assumed Paul was there. So they drag this brother and other brothers out of this particular home and they drag them before the magistrate. The city is in an uproar. Now here's the, here's, here's the thought. These new believers, put yourself in that place. You just got born again. What are you thinking of? All this uproar, all this noise, this yelling, people cursing, what are you thinking? You're a new believer? That's the setting. So the brothers, that night, they, they escort Paul out of the city. He goes to Berea. And when he gets to Berea, guess what he does? Goes to the synagogue and preaches the gospel. Oh, isn't that an indomitable spirit? See, listen, listen. Sometimes in our lives, here's what, here's what happens to us. We think, okay, because this happened, or this situation happened, or this circumstance happened, or this uncomfortable situation happened, or this person is not doing what they're supposed to do, I'm supposed to quit. Just in case you didn't know. When it comes to Jesus, you're never supposed to quit. Amen. Just in case you did not know. You have no excuse to quit. It doesn't matter what he does, she does, they did. It doesn't matter. You have no excuse to quit. Do you hear what I'm saying? Thank you. Thank you for your enthusiasm. That's, that's real good there. 
All right, now let's go, let's go back to the, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 because that's the setting. I want you to remember that setting because it's important um, that when we, when we study Scripture that we're able to put context together because you have to draw meaning and application from what? Context. If you do not have context, and what is context? Context is what, when you look in the Bible and you read about people, what are those people doing? What's happening in their particular situation? What's happening in that particular scenario? What's going on? Who's doing what? Where are they doing? What, uh, why is it happening? And see, it's from that that you get context, and from that you're able to do what? Make accurate application in your own life. Many times we'll go to the Bible and we'll pull out something God said to the Jews. And it, may be, it might be applicable to you. It might have a remote application, and it may not. Do you follow what I'm saying? See, sometimes we wonder why we go to the scripture, we pull out a scripture, it don't work. Sometimes it could be it's not even for you. Oh, man. So, 1 Thessalonians, here we go, beginning at verse 3. We thought it best to remain in Athens. So what, how did he get to Athens? This is Paul speaking. He, he went to Berea, and then the Jews came from Thessal, Thessalonica, or Thessalonia. They went to Berea, chasing them down. And so they went to Berea, caused trouble in Berea, and so the brothers there at Berea, and by the way, when he got to Berea, what did he do? He started another church. Some Jews, a number of Gentiles got born again. Another church was started. But because they threatened his life, the brothers had to escort him out of Berea, and he ended up, they brought him to Athens. He had to travel south. So now he's in Athens. Are you with me? All right. So verse 3, he says there, we, it, we thought it best to remain in Athens by ourselves. Why, why, does he, why does he say by ourselves? Because what he did was he left Silas and Timothy in Berea. Because they weren't trying to kill Silas and Timothy. They wanted, they wanted to kill him. But because we couldn't wait any longer for news about you, what is Paul saying? He's saying that, I was so concerned. Now, why was he concerned? Because again, let's stop just for a moment. He was concerned because he left this fledgling baby church in the midst of chaos, social chaos. The city was in an uproar. It was, it was threatened by this mob. And now you have these Jews and these, this large number of Greeks and the prominent women who had now given their lives to Jesus Christ and they are there in the midst of all that. One of the things that I take from this is this. We must remember that as believers, persecution is not something that is foreign to the church. It is something that is a part of what the church has been called to endure. So he says, we sent, we, we had to have word about, we were concerned. What's going to happen to these new believers? Will their faith stand in the midst of such persecution? Will their faith stand? So he says, I couldn't take it any longer. I had to send Timothy to check on you. So Silas and Timothy, they come to Berea, they get to Athens. And when they get to Athens, Paul says to Timothy, go now back to Thessalonica and check on that church. Do you get the picture? So let's move on from there. Verse 4, he says that um, because now you understand why he's writing the letter. Verse 4, he says, in fact, when we were with you, we told you ahead of time that we were going to suffer persecution. So he says to the church, they're baby Christians, we're going to suffer persecution. Oh, that's, that's quite welcoming, isn't it? You, I mean, you just, you just came to Christ, and now your, your teacher is saying, guess what, folks? You will be persecuted. He says, he goes on to say there, as, and as you know, that's exactly what happened. 
But when I couldn't wait any longer, I sent Timothy to find out about your faith. I wanted to see whether I wanted to see whether the tempter had in some way tempted you, making our work meaningless. What is he saying there? He's saying that it's possible for somebody to receive the message of Christ and then Satan to come in and cause so much disturbance in their life that that person chooses to leave Christ. That's what he's saying. And so he's saying, I wanted to know, was this the case with you? All that work and all that effort, was it for nothing? You know, I love, I love the Bible and I love the scripture and I love the details of the scripture because it does tell a story. Let's keep moving. He, now verse six, he says, but when Timothy came from you unto us and brought us, what kind of news? Good news. Good news. Good tidings of your faith. Notice, first one, Timothy went and checked you out and what did he check out? He checked out your faith and your love. I wonder what, 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 what should be indicators of a healthy church or a healthy believer? What, what would be an indicator of that? It would be how strong your faith is. What does that mean? Your faith in what? If you recall, when we read back in Acts chapter 17, what did Paul preach to them? He preached who Jesus was, and who Jesus did, what Jesus did, who Jesus was and what Jesus did. So what was their faith supposed to be in? Who Jesus was and what Jesus did. What should your faith be in? Who Jesus was and what Jesus did. What day? Every day. Listen to me, folks. Everything, listen, everything, if you're a believer, everything that you get from God comes from Jesus. Who he was and what he did. So my faith every day has to be in who Jesus was and what he did. My faith is not in me. My faith is not in somebody else. My faith is in Jesus. Now here's the good thing. If my faith is in who Jesus was and what Jesus did, will that ever change? Listen, listen, listen to me. Who Jesus was will never change. What Jesus did will never change. So if my faith is anchored in what he has done and who he was, that means what? My faith cannot fail. Oh, that's good. Amen. See, because sometimes in Christianity, here's what happens. We, 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 we think in terms that our faith has to be in us, in our performance. And here's what happens. We, we get discouraged because our performance is not up to par. And the tendency is, is to want to give up. But see, your faith is never supposed to be in you. Listen, does that make sense to you? Your faith is not, cannot be in you. Because if it is, number one, could you save you? No, it took Jesus to save you. And if it took him to save you, guess what? It's going to take him to keep you and sustain you. Do you hear what I'm saying? See, that's the victory of Christianity, that our faith is solidified in he who cannot fail, he who cannot change, our faith is solidified in him. So when Paul says to the, in regards to the Thessalonians, he says, we, Timothy checked out your faith, he was checking out whether or not their faith was still in Jesus. You see what I'm saying? It's amazing. This is the foundation of Christianity, and yet it's amazing how in our day, so many people have gotten away from this. Even a lot of the preaching and teaching has gotten away from who Jesus is. It's amazing. And let me just say it again. If you're going to have victory in your life, it's going to be because, it's going to be because your faith is in Jesus. Listen to me. In, in the midst of your, look at circumstances will come and go. Have you ever noticed that? If you live long enough, circumstances come and go. You'll have a good season, and then you'll have a season of your life that there's, it's, it's more tumultuous and more trouble and more pressure. That's the way life works. But see, here's the way you can be consistent. If your faith is in Jesus all the time, it doesn't matter what comes through your life because your faith is anchored in the same one. You see what I'm saying? See, that's the victory in Christianity. You know, this
this is the first Wednesday night of the year that we've met together, and I'm already yelling at you already. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> so he says, Timothy checked out your faith. He checked out your love. Now, what is, how, how does that work? Here's the, here's the reality. If my faith is in Jesus Christ and what he did, then that will relate to me having love for everybody else who belongs to Jesus Christ. You see what I'm saying? If my faith is anchored in Jesus Christ, then automatically that is going to relate to me loving my brother and sister. Do you understand that? See, if my faith is shaky in Jesus Christ, watch out. Because anything can happen. So you better pray that your brother's and sister's faith stays in Jesus Christ. <laughs> pray their faith stays strong. <laughs> he says, so he says that your faith checked out good, therefore your love. That's why faith is, is noted first. Why? Because in order for your love to work, it has to be based on your faith in Jesus and what he did. Does that make sense to you? That's the only way your love works. Because the love that you have comes from who? Jesus. All right. Look at verse 7. We keep tracking here. Therefore, brother, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. So what he said? He said, because your faith was so intact, even in the midst of these people trying to kill us, we were comforted. And see, now you, I think you can get the picture why the scripture says it is a type of faith that overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Now, why did he say that? Because in this world, you have changing circumstances. You have people that will come against you at times. But if my faith, again, is solidified in Jesus Christ, in who he was and what he did, that means that that faith overcomes every other situation. Okay. He says in verse 8, now you understand this is just a review, right? Somebody said, that's a long review, man. That's <laughs> Verse 8, for now we live if we stand fast in the Lord. Now, he's writing this letter, and let me say this. This letter was written in response to Timothy's report. So when you read 1 Thessalonians, you know that that letter was written in response to the report that Timothy brought to Paul. Timothy brought to Paul that this church is, even in the midst of this pressure, persecution, their faith and their love was still very strong. And then you will find out as we get farther on in the letter that Paul addresses some other specific issues. And these specific issues were the result of what Timothy shared with him in regards to what was going on in that church. So he says in verse 8 here, he says, if you stand fast in the Lord, he says, we live if you stand fast. Now, this idea of standing fast means what? It simply means that you stand fast. How do you stand fast? It means that you keep your stance in who Jesus was and what he did. Folks, it really is all about Jesus. And, and, and as you live the Christian life, if you, if you let that sink in, that real, it really is all about Jesus. And so everything about me, it's about Jesus. I'm simply a vessel. You're simply a vessel. And as we yield, we yield to the reality of Jesus Christ. His spirit works in us and accomplishes that which he wants to do in regards to his will through us. It's not about us. That's, that's, uh, that's quite challenging for we Americans because the culture tells us it's all about us. And many times we buy into that notion. It's all about us. And sometimes we bring that into the church culture. It's about us. Okay. 
Now, I wanted to get down to verse 10. Because it says here, he says that night and day praying exceeding that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now, when he talks about faith, what is he talking about again? He's talking about what? When he talks about faith? Who Jesus was and what Jesus did. Is that clear? Now, now let me say this to you, because many times, you know, with, with, with faith in our day and time, um, Sometimes people, you know, we talk about faith, believing God for a house, believing God for finances, believing God for healing. All those are legitimate issues. But guess what? Do you know where that faith comes from? It comes from the faith that you have in who Jesus was and what Jesus did. You see what I'm saying? In fact, you'll find out that it's much easier for your faith to work if your faith is anchored in the person of Jesus Christ. Then when you start believing God for things that you need, it's not some struggle. Do you follow what I'm saying? If that is your premise where you're believing God from as to who the person of Jesus was and what he did, then anything else you have to believe God simply is a byproduct of that. You see what I'm saying? So he says, again, in verse 10 of chapter 3, night and day praying exceeding that we might see your faith. So he wants to see, why does he want to see that? Because, again, this is a baby church. This is a church that was just birth. And Paul was an apostle, but part of the apostle's office is that of a pastor. This, what you're seeing is, by the Spirit of God, the heart of a shepherd you find out that in the writings of Paul, if you read very carefully, Paul never used the people for his own selfish gain. Paul's heart was toward them, helping them mature in Christ. That was his passion. And so what, what does that say? It shows us what God has given as a true pastor's heart, a heart toward the people, that they grow up in Christ Jesus. And so he's separated from them, not by choice, but by, by, but by necessity, because his life is being threatened. And he's saying, night and day I'm praying that I might see you again. And what, notice what he's saying, that I might strengthen your faith. What is he saying? That I might strengthen your faith, or that I might make your faith, I assist you in your faith even being stronger in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Even stronger. I would submit to you this, that there are different levels of faith. There are different degrees of faith. Your faith can be weak. Your faith can be strong. Your faith can be very strong. Your faith can be non-existent. There are different degrees of faith. And here's the thing. If you want to live a quality Christian life, then your faith in who Jesus was and what he did has to grow. It cannot stay stagnant. And one of the things, one of the, listen to me, on a personal level, I have the responsibility each and every day to work, to, to allow my faith to grow. How does faith grow? Great faith grows in one respect by me hearing God's word, being exposed to God's word. But here's the other side of that. It also grows when I practice what I hear. You follow what I'm saying? So I have a responsibility every day to ensure that my faith grows. If I do not do that, more than likely my faith is not growing. Oh, come on, somebody, you need to hear me. You have to hear and you have to practice. That's how your faith grows. And here's what happens. As your faith grows, you become stronger in your spirit. And what does that equate to? It equates to you can deal with a lot more opposition. Come on, somebody, something that comes against you that causes you to feel threatened or to be the feel that you can't make it or feel like you you're 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 not going to make it or or you're going to 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 be overcome when your faith grows. It allows you to stand and not back up and not be crushed, but to stand and go through whatever confronts you. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
So the letter here, it's showing us, and, and Paul is it, it, it revealing to us that faith is not something that you just get. You know, I came to Jesus, that's all. No, no, no. Your faith must be continually growing every day. That's a good question, isn't it? Is my faith growing? My faith needs to be stronger than it was last year. Do you understand what I'm saying? What, what bothered me last year and the poor before that shouldn't be the same thing taking me out now. Do you follow what I'm saying? Amen. If my faith grows, it will not be. Amen. And that, that is a continual process. My faith in who Jesus was and what he did, that needs to grow in me. Everything starts with Jesus. Okay, verse 11. He says this, now unto him, now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto him. What is it? Now he's praying. He's actually, by the Spirit of God, showing us the prayer that he's been praying for the church of Thessalonica. He says, and the Lord make you increase and abound in love. Now, it's interesting to me. That he says that your faith, because he, he said when Timothy went and checked you out, he found out that your faith was strong and your love was strong. But notice he's praying that their love gets what? Stronger. Now, what does that mean to you? What it should say to us is this. There is no leveling off point. There is no point where you get to a position here on earth and you think, well, you know, I got it made now. Oh, yeah, I don't have to do that stuff anymore. I've, I'm past that. That, that. that studying the word stuff, I don't have to do that anymore. That praying stuff, I don't have to do that anymore. No, I, I, but see, I've reached a level, you know. Now I can just ease, take ease and just kick back now. That doesn't exist. And if you hear anybody saying that, they're out of their minds, okay? No. In this walk in on the earth, we are constantly growing. You understand what I'm saying? And see, here's the thing. Here's the thing. My, one of the desires, and this is one of the things that we pray for a lot at this church, is that you would have a hunger for that. That it wouldn't be something that you can just, oh, you know, uh, I can give me a little bit of Jesus. That's, no, no, no. That you would have such a hunger. Because see, here's the thing. That hunger drives you. It motivates you. You're not satisfied. You're not satisfied just to, to wear the label of Christian, but you want this to mean something to you. You want it to, to really translate into reality in your everyday life. You want a hunger for that. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. So Paul is saying, he's saying, yes, yes, your love is strong, but listen, I want it to be stronger. Let me, let me say this to you. Brothers and sisters, the world that we face today is very powerful. The, the culture is very powerful. The, the communication means and the wording is very powerful. It comes at us 24-7. If you're not strong in your faith, it will completely overtake you. We are bombarded on every side today. And if you don't have something on the inside that is stronger, you will be overtaken. The philosophies of the world are so powerful and the, and the, the, the means that are used now to captivate our senses are so powerful that if you are trying to make it on your own strength, you will be gobbled up. And one of the things that we're facing today is that a lot of the people who go to church are in that state. A lot of the people who stand on the pulpit are in that state. The culture has swallowed them up. And God's will is that his people not be swallowed up by the culture. And you listen to me, listen. If these people born in the, they, were, they came to Christ in the midst of a hostile environment, people threatening them, Families being separated, being called names, your children being called names, grandparents not visiting their children anymore because of this, this person of Jesus Christ, all those kinds of dynamics happening, and yet they can stand. 
Your faith is tested by the pressure that is arrayed against you. That's the only way you know. So here, here's what that says to me. In order for my faith to stand this, the onslaught of what's happening today in our world, I have to be strong on the inside. So it says, and the Lord make you increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Verse 13. Again, this is his prayer. He's praying for this for this church. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. That word established in the King James reading there, the word there is sterizo, and it means to turn completely away from. What is he saying there? He's saying that this person of Jesus Christ, his spirit, and he's praying this for the church, that he would cause you to be unblameable and unholy. Folks, listen, that's not human ability there. You and I can't do that for ourselves. That level or degree of sanctification is supernatural. And he's praying for the church that in the midst of a very evil, dark world, that the church would not just survive, but that the church would literally thrive. And that when Jesus would turn, returns, the church would be unspotted. Now, folks, listen, that's saying a lot. You, you look around your world, you look around all the media that we are exposed to and things that come into our minds or attempt to come into our minds, thinking in terms of being unspotted. And see, in addition to that, today we have people who are so compromising the gospel and compromising the standards of holiness that they tell you it's okay. You got a little problem, that's okay. A little sin, that's okay. You see, he's saying in his prayer, no, it's not okay. So I'm, I am, listen, I am to rely, here it is, on the person and work of Christ, what provides for me what? The power of the Holy Spirit that works in me and causes me to overcome the flesh the sin and the devil. It's not my ability. Now listen, that works with fear. That works with relational issues. That works with any kind of thing you deal with in life. You have to rely on the person of Jesus Christ, and by relying on the person and work of Jesus Christ, it releases what? It releases the power of the Holy Spirit in you so that you can defeat and overcome that which threatens you. Do you hear what I'm saying? Stand with me, please. So the church of Thessalonica, church born in the midst of persecution, Yet their faith grew and was strong. Their love grew and was strong. And the great apostle Paul says, my prayer is that your faith and your love grows more. Let me ask you this. If Paul's desire by the Spirit of God was that was for, was for the church of Thessalonica, for that for the church of Thessalonica, that their faith would grow, that the word would grow if that was the case there, what would the Spirit of God's desire be for you? Would it be for your faith to grow? Would it be for your love to grow? To become stronger? Would that be the case? Now listen, how does that come about? It comes about, and let me say this to you, thank God for you being willing to be here. Because by being here, you are exposing yourself to God's truth. And see, here, here, here's the other part of that. 
you have exposed yourself to God's truth. Now you have to trust the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, listen. You can never trust in your ability. That's one of the, the, the fallacies of Christianity is that many people are trying to trust in their own ability. You will fail and fail miserably. You have to trust in the power of the Spirit of God. That's why God gets the glory. Because it's not our strength, it's his. He gets the credit. Listen, listen to me. Wherever you are right now in this auditorium, wherever you are in your life, in your journey on this earth, wherever you are, the Holy Spirit says, your faith is to be stronger. Your love is to be stronger. But that doesn't come about by your ability. It comes about by the power of the Holy Spirit. And see, here's where faith is so important because faith is what? Faith, or you can use the word believe, means what? You are willing to adhere to, rely on, trust in what Jesus has done. And when you do that, what that does, it correlates to the Holy Spirit supplying you the power source that you need in your life to deal with what you need to deal with. All of us have something to deal with. Did you know that? Don't look around and act like it's all on you. All of us have something to deal with. But it's the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us the victory. And we must rely, stick to that reality. Listen, uh, those, it may be somebody either here in the audience or somebody watching by live streaming. When we speak of this idea of trusting in the person of Jesus Christ, who he was and what he did, perhaps you don't, this is foreign to you. You've never trusted in the person of Jesus Christ, who he was and what he did. You don't know anything about that. You've heard about church and you've heard about different religions. You've heard about uh, people that say different things, but you know nothing about the person of Jesus Christ. Listen, listen. God didn't give us a religion. He sent us a person. Jesus Christ is a person. And so the question becomes, do you know this person? And if you don't know him, you can know him. He desires that you know him. First of all, I'm going to pray for those who don't know him. You don't know the person of Jesus Christ. You don't know. You, you, you can talk about church, but you don't know Jesus Christ. But if you want to know him, if now the Spirit of God, there's something drawing you, something, you might be home in your living room or you might be in some other room, but there's something that seems to be trying to capture your attention in regards to Jesus Christ. I submit to you, that's the Holy Spirit. And he's drawing your heart. He loves you. He loves you more than any human being could ever love you. The person and work of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you right now, if you don't know him, you might be watching my live streaming. You might be in this auditorium right now. You don't know Jesus Christ. You know about church. You know about pastor so-and-so, but you don't know the person of Jesus Christ. You've never really had been in a relationship with him. Now is the perfect time. I'm going to ask you if you would just pray with me right now. And this is specifically for those who don't know Jesus Christ. You don't know the person of Jesus Christ. But you want to yield to this drawing that you're sensing right now. I'm going to ask you simply to say this with, would you, would you say this? Would you say, Lord Jesus, I come to you now. I've heard your word. I believe that you are real. I believe that you are the very son of God. I believe that you are the one that died for me. You are the one who has suffered for me. And I choose now, I choose right now to, to meet you and to give my life to you, to allow you to become my Lord and my Savior. You're not a religion. 
You're not a church building. You are a person. And I receive you as my Lord in the name of Jesus. Now you may be here tonight and as I said earlier, we all in this life on earth, you walk through stuff. We all do. But as we walk through, here's the difference. Your faith has to be anchored in who Jesus was and what he did. And you must rely on the power of God's spirit to help you, not just one day, but every day and throughout the day. And so where you are right now in life, maybe you're facing a particular challenge in your life right now. And sometimes you feel overcome, you feel overwhelmed, you feel like you can't make it, you feel like you're, you're failing. But you just want to just, just reestablish your faith in who Jesus is and what he did for you. And in this particular challenge in your life right now, you just want to be able to say, I'm trusting Jesus. I'm trusting what he has already done for me. I'm trusting that power to help me. Would you pray with me right now? Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, we again, we again herald the reality of who Jesus is. The very son of God. God made known in human flesh. And we herald the fact that it is in his death, his burial, and his resurrection that we receive your divine power. We receive your righteousness. And Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that our, our walk with you is not based on our performance, but it's based on our trust in what Jesus has already performed. And so right now in Jesus' name, here it is, we receive your strength to deal with where we are in life right now. The circumstances that we're dealing with right now. We receive your supernatural strength. And Father, we thank you for taking care of us. We thank you. We choose to trust you. Just like the Thessalonians did in the midst of pressure, they chose to trust you. We in turn choose to trust you. And in Jesus' name, we thank you. We praise you. We honor you. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you for the weight of your presence, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you tonight. Thank you again so much for coming. And we are trusting that this is going to be the greatest year that you've ever had in your life. Amen. God bless you.